So we've got um, a fairly short time, but this is a fairly short trailer, so um, I, think, I think we'll be okay. So basically, just to give you a flavour of um, Lucy's forthcoming project, and maybe she'd like to speak a little bit about it um, after the clip. <coughs> I've been thinking a lot about why I'm doing what I'm doing and over the past few days. I came to the conclusion I thought, actually, I'm going to be really arrogant, thinking that I can actually do a film and do it through my eyes and actually expect people to understand. And it is, in some senses, to be like me. I guess I'm very conscious of the fact that I, my history starts, in some senses, um, in, in, in 62 when I was born. There is nothing that I know of previous to that. And everything that is a history to me, in some senses, in one sense, actually is a world. It's something that I was, I was written into, literally written into, on a document, signed, sealed, and signed off by the Governor General of Hong Kong. That doesn't really connect to me. It doesn't have any place with me or for me in that sense. Um, which is actually kind of weird. It doesn't matter how, how learned you are, whether you learn your native tongue, whether you, you, know, you study Chinese culture, which to a certain extent I have for fun, that's never actually going to really feel the thing that's missing. If it helps, and I hope it does, for people to understand that there are genuine challenges that have to be considered when you are thinking about adopting translation, then I'll, I think I'll have done a good thing. very much for that. So would you like to tell us a bit more about um, how the project came about and what you're actually planning mm. and where you are with it? <laughs> oh, yes. um, back in 2010 I was contacted by the British Adoption and Fostering Agency. Um, they were ba have basically finally received funding to do a research project um, concerning 100 British Chinese adoptees, basically from Hong Kong, from two main orphanages, one of them being Fan Ling, the other one being Po Leung Cook, and I think there was another one, St. Christopher's. Um, I'm actually one of those 100 foundlings that was put up for adoption and ended up being adopted by um, a Caucasian family over here. Uh, the BAAF managed to track down all 100 of us and uh, 78 agreed to participate to a certain level with the research and I think it was about 68 to 69 participated in the entire research project which was basically um, a paper questionnaire which was more like a booklet and a face-to-face -face interview, in-depth interview um, and they're hoping to publish their findings later on I think this year. Um, I mean, I'd always known that I was adopted, um, although my adopted parents were very reticent in actually talking to me about my circumstances. Um, and I think like many of the other adoptees that I, I've met, we always knew that there were others like us, but in an age before sort of mobile phones and internet, how would you actually go about finding one another? And it was actually quite astonishing because I met up for the first time in 2010 with 12 other ladies who were all from the same baby's home as me. And it was quite a daunting 
frightening but exhilarating experience. And it was from that initial meeting of coming across 12 other women exactly like me, um, all Chinese, uh, looking obviously Chinese, but all with different regional UK accents, which completely blew my mind, that I realized that there was a possibility of a, a story to tell. It was fascinating that we, there was almost an unwritten understanding that we all had, even though we hadn't met each other before, of this, this basis of the fact that we had been transported from one country and brought up in another. And, and pre-multicultural sort of multicultural UK had, to varying uh, differing degrees, successfully coped with the challenges of looking one way and sounding another way. Um, so it sort of sparked off in me two things. One was a, a, a project, a, in some senses a vanity project. I, I wrote a, a one-woman play which was basically a, a, a sort of fictionalized account of, of what it feels like to be, um, to be one thing and, 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 and yes, another thing. So to look one way and yet to, to, to basically sound another way. Um, and what it is like to sort of grow up in, in, in 60s UK um, basically being an alien um, and having to, to, to deal with many of the challenges that that, that put a lot of us through. The other thing was that um, that sort of sparked off in me was actually trying to get a better understanding of of, of identity. It's something that um, many people just take for granted, and it's something that's always fascinated me. Is that um, a lack of identity, especially when you're looking back at your parents and you don't actually see the same image? What does that do? How does that affect affect what you do and how you perceive yourself? And it's been one, I suppose, one of the things that has driven me to go into the, the industry that I do, um, to actually sort of try and find out what, essentially, what is it, what is identity without actually having that social mirror that reflects you, that lo looks back into you. Um, and I was interested in discovering whether any of the other adoptees actually felt the same way. And surprisingly or not unsurprisingly, many of them did um, have sort of varying issues or concerns about their lack of identity, or shall we say a loss of um, and a yearning for actually to be able to get back things that, like the language facility, that obviously disappeared when we came over here. Um, and it was from that that I then decided, wrongly or rightly, I would have a go at making a documentary. I'm now, I would imagine, about two thirds of the way through filming it um, and hoping to get most of the remainder of the footage filmed by the end of July. I think that might be rather ambitious. And then from there on, the work will really start when I have to sort of edit and pull the documentary together. So that's where I am. Fantastic. <coughs> OK, I'm sure there are some questions out there um, before we have to finish in a few minutes. Um, yes, Ross. Um, well, a comment and then a couple of questions. I guess what, what you're saying resonates to me with some of the things that Jackie Kay has written about. I don't know if you've read any of her no. novel or her journalistic work about being adopted mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, Scotland around the same period. But then also um, a documentary which you may or may not have seen called, an American documentary called Daughter from Denang. Uh, I've heard, yeah. Mm. About mm. the uh, you know, women's adopted in the US South who then goes back to. Vietnam, very tragic mm. documentary, totally unprepared. Uh, anyway, the, the question I want to ask, which is totally different, uh, was whether you knew of the, of the hundred who were brought over from Hong Kong, what percentage were women and how, how much does that? Impact? They were all women. They're all women. Um, there were more than a hundred that were brought over, but the, I think it was about 104. Two of them were, were boys that were actually going mm. to extended family. So as such, they weren't adopted but all of us who were adopted were girls and I think there were very few boys that were actually taken into the homes in Hong Kong during that period. Yeah, probably not too surprising. No. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rosa. Was, was this, all, did, did this all happen in the 60s in a particular time and then when did it stop? It basically started I think as far as I can see round about the mid 1950s 
um, initially the program was set up to actually place um, orphans or foundlings from the orphanages in Hong Kong with uh, Asian American families but not unsurprisingly they wanted boys and there weren't any so obviously because Hong Kong was a crown colony it was then sort of opened up um, to the UK <laughs> now there were kids that went off to America, Canada and Australia but this particular program the Hong Kong project tied in with the UN Year of the Refugee so that is where us 100 sort of ended up in, in the UK and um, that the Hong Kong project came to an end in 1964 as such but they were still um, sending children over to be adopted and I think that tailed off around about 1973 Any other questions? Yes. Um, so just to clarify, is it, are you doing a film about these 100 people or is it about transracial adoption? Um, it's a combination. The documentary basically is, is looking at the subject of transracial adoption, um, British Chinese, and uh, basically sort of identity. And I'm doing it through sort of my experience and my connections with some of the other Hong Kong adoptees. <coughs> Originally I was going to try and attempt to do a documentary concentrating on those 100. I think because the average age of us adoptees is 49. And for many of the women, I think this was the first time that they had actually thought about the context in which they had been adopted and how they as individuals fitted into society and for many of them I think it's really really raw uh, and because I, I work in the arts um, expressing how I feel is not a problem it doesn't mean to say that it doesn't affect me but I think a lot of the women were, uh, were very shy of actually doing that um, and I think one has to be sensitive to that and for many of them especially the ones that came over in the 50s I think it, it it's, it proved to be quite a traumatic sort of experience. Um, so yeah, you can't do transracial adoption anyway. Oh yes, you can. Yeah. Can you? Yeah, intercountry adoption. Yeah. I think it's called now. Intercountry, right? Yeah. They don't allow cross-racial adoption. Uh, oh, they do. Yes, yeah, they yeah. Do. Yeah. Was yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it, adoption per se is a contentious issue. Uh, Inter-country adoption, transracial adoption is even more of a, it, it, it is a bit of a Marmite subject, you either love it or you hate it. Um, and there are, you know, sort of, I constantly now get asked, you must be, you must be either pro or anti-adoption, transracial adoption. It's not that easy. I mean, it, 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 personally my view is that taking a child away from its original context has to be a last resort and at the end of the day it should the first and foremost thing must be for the good and the betterment of the child ideally keeping that child within its natural culture um, sort of ethnic surroundings is the best but sometimes that's not always possible um, my circumstances were I was I came over in the early 60s things such as you know sort of cultural displacement mother tongue they hadn't entered the vocabulary yet so it was an unknown quantity um, and I would like to think that that we as a society have learned that may be a moot point but um, it's a very difficult thing to actually I think discuss and people still find it very difficult to discuss Um, I was 11 months. 11 months? Mm. Wow. Yeah. Okay, m maybe one time for one l last question, if you'd like to. Um, yeah. yeah, I was just going to ask if you've tried to find out what records there are in, in Hong Kong. Um, I am now in the process of actually uh, seeking my um, <coughs> Hong Kong social services files, if indeed there are any. I mean, the, the trouble with that particular period of time is the records weren't particularly extensive, A, because many of the foundlings um, were left in public places. There were, it's very difficult to trace sort of where these children came from. But I know where I was left and 
um, which is on Austin Avenue, which is now, uh, where I was left is now nightclub. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that says. Um, but I've also been told that I can actually um, try and get my records from the local police station if it still exists, because they never close those cases. So that would be quite interesting if I could, yes. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're going to have to wrap up with this. Yes. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much.